إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد قال جل وعلا سبحان الذي أصر بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير Respected ulama, elders, brothers, sisters, little ones, salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After praising the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations upon our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this ajiz, incapable one, fakir, miskeen, dhaif, mustajir, al-muhtaj ila rahmati rabbihi wa barakati, begin as always by first thanking you, my host, for giving me this opportunity to convey the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these efforts of yours in listening to this message as I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these tutti fruity efforts of mine in trying to deliver the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it was revealed upon our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in its true and pure form without changing and without diluting the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over 1400 years ago. My young friends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his blessed book, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu kunu qawwameena bil qist shuhada'a lillah walaw ala anfusikum awil walideen wala qarabeen All those of you who believe, be upholders of justice. Be witnesses for Allah. Even if it's not in your self-interest or the interest of your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters. Let not the hatred of a people incite you to be unjust, O Muslim. I know, always be just. And stand for justice. It's close to piety. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, قُلِ الْحَقِّ وَلَوْ كَانَ مُرْرًا عُدْعُ إِلَى سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْئِزَةِ الْحَسْنَةِ It's your responsibility that you invite towards Allah. And when you invite towards Allah, you use wisdom, hikmat. But at the same time, قُلِ الْحَقِّ You will always speak the truth whether people like it or people do not like it you yourself will always speak the truth and when you speak the truth naturally people don't like listening to what is haq. you'll get backlash you'll get criticism as believers, in Allah's way, we do not fear the reproach and the criticism of the critics. Don't fear when speaking the haq and the truth that you will lose your job and as a result you will be affected. Why? وَمَا مِنْ دَابَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا يَعْلَمُ مُسْتَقَرَّهَا وَمَسْتَوْدَعَهَا Your employer, your boss doesn't provide for you. Your provider is the Almighty Allah. He's taken the responsibility of providing for every human, for every jinn, for every animal, for every bird, for every insect, for every fish within this multiverse. If the entire universe gets together to withhold one morsel, one morsel, every single human being, every single jinn within the multiverse gets together to withhold one morsel which Allah has destined that you receive, they will not be able to withhold it from you. You will receive that 
before you leave this world. So do not fear when you speak the truth that you will lose the dunya, you will lose your sustenance and your risk. For Allah takes care of your risk and all your affairs. Prophet Sallallahu said, أَفْضَلُ الْجِحَادِ كَلِمَةُ حَقٍ إِنْدَ سُلْطَانٍ جَائِرٍ the best form of jihad. What is the best form of jihad? That you speak the truth in the presence of a zalim king. Why is this one of the best forms of jihad, speaking the truth in the presence of a zalim king? When a person goes out to elevate the kalima la ilaha illallah in the battlefield, my young friends, there's no guarantee that he will receive martyrdom. You go out to elevate the kalima la ilaha illallah. There's a chance that you will receive martyrdom. And there's a chance that you will return alive. Be it with mali ghanimat booty or be it without mali ghanimat. But speaking the truth in the presence of a zalim king. A king known for his oppression and his zulm and his injustice, and you speak haq in his presence, the chances are that you will only return as a martyr. And why is this the best form of jihad? Because if you do not speak the truth, this, was, this will just encourage his injustice and his oppression and it will never come to an end. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Muslim akhu al-Muslim. Yakuffu alayhi dhayatahu wa yuhutuhu min warahi. All Muslims are brothers. A Muslim never abandons his brother. He never allows him to go to waste. Rather, he helps him. He supports him. He responds to his call and cry. Why? Al-Muslimun, al-Mu'minun, ka rajulin wahidin, in ishtaka aynuhu ishtaka kullu, wa in ishtaka raksu ishtaka kullu. The entire ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is like one single body. If any one limb of this body is in pain, then the entire body feels that pain. If the head is in pain, then the entire body Feel the pain of that limb. If the eye is in pain, the entire body feels that pain. If one Muslim is in pain, if a Palestinian is in pain, then the Pakistani thousands of miles away in Pakistan will feel that pain. A Chinese Muslim thousands of miles away in China will feel that pain. A Muslim in America thousands of miles away will feel that pain. If any one limb is in pain, the entire body feels the pain. You know, on the internet, you'll get that the yellow one is Masjid Sakhra and the uh, one with the grey dome is Masjid. No, it's the, the it's the piece of land which is all around 150 square, 150,000 square meters. That is Masjid Aqsa. That piece of land is sacred land. What's so special about Masjid Aqsa? That they prepared to sacrifice their children and have been sacrificing their children for over 75 years. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked, which is the first masjid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed on the earth? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Which was the mas first masjid that was built? Prophet ﷺ said, masjid haram Then the Prophet ﷺ was asked, which was the second masjid that was built on the dunya. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that after 40 years, after Masjid al Haram, Masjid al Aqsa was built. It's the second masjid that was built on the earth. And it was the first Qibla of the believers. Some scholars say the first Qibla was the Holy Kaaba. Some scholars say no. The first Qibla was Masjid al Aqsa. The Prophet ﷺ prayed towards Masjid Aqsa whilst he was in Makkah. 
and he prayed towards Masjid Aqsa whilst he was in Medina. 16 to 17 months, the Prophet Sallallahu faced towards Masjid Aqsa. But in his heart and his but in his heart, the Prophet always had this burning desire to face the Holy Kaaba. And what the Prophet would do is when he would finish prayer, every now and then he would look towards the heaven, waiting. Okay, one day maybe Allah will order us to face Masjid Haram, the Holy Kaaba. And one day the verse was revealed. Oh Muhammad, we will turn you to the Qibla that you so wish to follow. And the Prophet ﷺ had gone to the Banu Salama to visit the mother of Bara ibn Azib ta'ala, and she was ill. He was reading Zuhr namaz inside that masjid when the hukum came to change. The Prophet ﷺ was reading Zuhr namaz. He read two rakats towards Baytul Maqdis. The hukum came and inside namaz the Prophet ﷺ turned to Baytullah. That's why that masjid is called Masjid Qiblatain. Then the Prophet ﷺ went from there back to Masjid Nabi ﷺ and he delivered a sermon and he was telling the Sahaba that the Qibla has changed. There was a Sahabi outside by the name of Saeed. He heard the Prophet ﷺ saying this so he wanted to be the first person to read namaz towards the new Qibla. So he quickly read two rakats towards Baytullah and then the Prophet ﷺ read Asr namaz and he read behind the Prophet ﷺ and this was the first namaz that was read towards the new Qibla. And after this, the people of Banu Harisa were informed and then the people of Masjid Quba were informed in Fajr Salah where they also turned towards the new Qibla. The point that I'm making is this was the first Qibla. How long did the Prophet ﷺ pray towards this Qibla? How long was he in Mecca for? 13 years. How long in Medina? 16 months. That, that's just over, that's around a year and a half. How long was his prophethood? He received prophet at the age of 40. He died at the age of 63, 23 years. 13 and one and a half, it's 14 and a half. It's around, it's around 60%, two thirds of his life, the Prophet read namaz towards Masjid Aqsa. This is the place, my young friends, in which the Prophet ﷺ on the night of Mi'raj, Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylan min al Masjid al Haram, when Allah honored our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ like Allah has never honored any other Nabi, any other Nabi, Musa was called to Mount Tur to converse with Allah, whereas the Prophet ﷺ was called to the heavens to converse with Him. And some People, some ulama go as, as far as saying that the Prophet وسلم, actually saw Allah on that night. From Masjid al Haram, he went to Masjid al Aqsa and look at the honor that the Prophet وسلم, received. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent around 124,000 prophets. Only Allah knows the exact number. Every single one of them, when the Prophet وسلم, was taken to Masjid al Aqsa, they were there. And they were waiting for the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid. And oh, and the adhan was called. And when the adhan was finished and it was time for salah, who received the honor of leading every Prophet in prayer? None other than your Nabi and my Nabi, Sayyid al Awwaleen wal Akhirin, Rahmatul Alameen. This Ajis Fakir doesn't know of any time since Allah has created this dunya. That in any one place, in any one place, in the dunya, I'm not talking about alami arwah, in the dunya, where in any one place you had every single prophet from Adam alayhi salatu was salam up to including our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa How blessed do you think that place is where every single Prophet assembled at one time. How, how blessed do you think it is? Why else do you think Allah says, Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi layla min al masjid al haram, alladhi barakna hawlahu. Yeah, so many blessings in that place. But in one hadith that is mentioned, 
There's not a single spun in that masjid where a prophet hasn't prayed or an angel hasn't stood up. Prophet ﷺ said, لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد All masjids are Allah's houses. They're the same. When it comes to worship, you worship in this masjid, you'll get the sawab. You worship in the masjid a few streets, you'll get the same sawab. So a person can't travel to a different masjid to earn reward because all masajid and al masajid lillah they're all for Allah they're the same except for three masjids they're an exception masjid haram the barakat there are completely different namaz there is a hundred thousand according to one hadith masjid the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam is blessed because this is the masjid of my Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam some hadith is fifty thousand some hadith is a thousand masjid aqsa if Masjid the Nabi is a thousand, then Masjid the Aqsa is five hundred. For every namaz that you read there, the reward that you will receive is five hundred. How many verses in the Book of Allah and these incidents that have taken place took place in that blessed land? Open the Book of Allah. How many verses? Surah Maryam comes to mind. Kafa ya insa dhikru rahmati rabbika abduhu Zakariya. Allah talks about Zakariya. Allah talks about إذ نادى ربه نداء خفيا when he called upon Allah, Allah very quietly. إني وهن الأضم مني وشتى على الرأس شيبة ولم أكن بدوائك رب شقيا. He's making dua to Allah. Oh Allah, look at me. My bones have become weak, crackling. I'm old. Oh Allah, my hair has turned grey. My wife is aqira, she's barren, she can't give birth. فحبلي من لدن كوليا يرثني ويرث من آل يعقوب. Oh Allah, I need somebody to carry on this work after me. Oh Allah, give me a son. And Allah said, Ya Zakariya, inna nubashiruka bi ghulamin ismu Yahya lam na'ja'allu min kablu samiya. All these verses, where did this take place? In the blessed land of Sham, Palestine. Look at the next ruku. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمْ إِذَنْ تَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيًّا فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا Kiyazim Maryam a.s. went to the eastern house to take a bath of menses. She screened herself. Jibra'il Amin appears before her in a human form. She's afraid. She says, I seek Allah's protection from you. And Jibra'il tells her, I'm not a human being. I'm an angel of Allah. Allah sent me to give you a child. She says, how can I have a child? No human has touched me. I'm not a bad woman. He says, Allah said, is it easy for me? Whenever I desire anything, I say, be, and it happens. Where did all this take place? When she came and people accused her of zina, and she pointed to her son, and he responded, Inni Abdullah atani al kitaba wa ja'alani nabiyya wa ja'alani mubarak and ayna ma kunt. Where did all this take place? Ya Isa inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya wa matahir. Where did all this take place? Rabbana anzil alina ma'idatan min as-sama takunu lana idan li awwalina wa akhirina. Where did this take place? Iz qalat il malaikatu ya Maryamu inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki. Where did all this take place? كلما دخل علي زكريا المحراب وجد عنده رزق قال يا مريم أن لك هذا where did this all take place إذ تصور المحراب إذ دخلوا إلى داوود ففزع من where did all this take place the story of داوود عليه السلام وما كفر سليمان ولكن الصياطين كفروا the stories of داوود where did all this take place in this blessed land how many أنبياء buried there you only Allah knows. Ibrahim is buried there. Ishaq is buried there. Yaqub is buried there. Uh, Suleiman is buried there. Dawood is buried there. And my young friends, this is where people will be gathered on the day of judgment. It is because of this. It is because of this. And only this. These people and Muslims, our brethren of Palestine, are laying down their lives. They're sacrificing their children. They're sacrificing their mothers their brothers and their sisters only and only for this and nothing else. This story didn't start a fortnight ago. This story started a very long time ago and only Allah and Allah alone knows when this will end. My young friends, we have a responsibility towards our brethren. What can we do? I'm not going to get a chance to explain everything that we can do because you obviously your Isha Namaz is at quarter past eight. But I will mention one thing. 
you've got a lot of videos going around with regards to do this, do this, do this, do this. The most important thing that you and I can do, everything else, if it's within the perimeters of the deen, within the boundaries of the deen, if you can do it, do it. Whether it's signing petitions, whether it's going out on protests, whether it's writing to your MPs, whether it's, you know, Twitter bashing, uh, sending out good, positive videos that support our narrative, whether it's joining organizations like Friends of Al-Aqsa, organizations are, which are within the law, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, friends, all of this will mean nothing if you don't do this thing that I'm about to mention. All of this, all of this will mean nothing if you and I don't do this. What is it? Fafirru in Allah. Fafirru in Allah. Turn to your Lord. If you and I do not turn to our Lord, you can do everything. You can do everything. It will not bring about the desired result. Karnevari zat, there is only one zat. The being that makes things happen, there's only one being, and that being is Allah. When I say we need to turn to Allah, what am I referring to? What am I referring to? My young friends, what I'm referring to is simply this. What is happening in the dunya and happens in the dunya, all these calamities that you and I see, whether it's in the form of hurricanes, whether it's in the form of tornadoes, whether it's in the form of landslides, whether it's in the form of earthquakes, all this bloodshed, whatever we see in terms of calamity, what is the biggest cause of these things? Open the book of Allah. Allah will say, if you were to ask Allah, Allah, why is this happening? Why is, why this earthquake happen? Why this happen? Why did this happen? What will Allah say? مَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ أَنْ كَثِيرٌ مَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ أَنْ كَثِيرٌ Any calamity that befalls you, it is because of your a'mal, it is because of your guna. Allah is saying this. Any calamity that befalls you is because of your guna, Allah is saying. Allah is saying, وَيَعْفُ أَنْ كَثِيرٌ Majority of the times Allah overlooks it. Allah overlooks it, He forgives it. He doesn't send anything. Allah says, Zahar al fasad fil barri wal bahar, bima kasabat aydi nas, liyudhiqahum ba'dha alladhi amilu la'allahum yarji'oon. Fasad, evil. Fitna, fasad has appeared in the land and see why. Allah says, bima kasabat aydi nas, again, it's because of your guna. So, why does Allah send all this? Just to give you a little bit of taste. This is not a this is not real punishment. Look at it like this. You've got a six foot six guy, and you've got a little kid in front of him, three years of age, and that little kid's done something wrong. So this six foot six hatta katta guy just sort of like touches him like that. Okay, don't do it again. Is he punishing him? He's not punishing him. That's not punishment for what that guy can do. If that guy were to hit him one, just give him one, he'd sink in the seven earth. That's the strength that he's given him. So what you see in terms of calamities, this is not real punishment. This is not... Ask Karun. Allah just introduced himself to Karun. His arrogance got the better of him. How did Allah introduce himself to Karun? What does Allah say? 
فما كان له من فئة ينصرونه من دون الله وما كان من المنتصرين down he went down his policies went and he's going down and he will keep on sinking right till the day of judgment this is just allah introducing himself this is just allah introducing himself you know like that six foot six guy just touching that little kid like this is just allah this is not even punishment this is not this is not what, what allah can do so what we see is just a little bit of test why لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِئُونَ Maybe you'll realize, you know, little kid realize, okay, bye. You know what? I better sort myself out because this guy's going to smash me if I don't sort myself out. So maybe when you and I see this, we might sort ourselves out and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All this that is happening in the dunya is because of our a'mal. And if we don't make tawbah and turn to Allah, you can protest till your heart's content till every single one of you lose your voice it will not have the desired effect nothing will change you know how khatarnaq guna how khatarnaq guna let me just give you an example prophet sallallahu is reading fajr salah it is it is surah room and he got confused in salah you know how is get mutashabihat Make a mistake, get confused with verses. So the Nabi of Allah has got confused in Salah. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said after Salah? The Prophet ﷺ said, Why is it that people read namaz with us that do la yuhsinun at tahur? These are the words. They don't do wuzu properly. And they're reading namaz with us. They are the cause of this confusion. It's because of them I got confused in Quran. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best ke la yuhsinu tuhur. What does it refer to? Muhaddisin have mentioned. No, did they leave something that zururi in wuzu or did they leave out some kazar if they've left out some zururi in the wuzu is not even done? Or did they leave out some sunnats in mustahabbas in wuzu? But the point I'm making is if they've left out some sunnahs and mustahab alanki, they're not zururi in wuzu. They're perfective wuzu. So an amal here has not been done in a manner that is desired where some sunnah or mustahab has been left. Look at the bebarkati of that. That has had an effect on who? Who was the Prophet ﷺ? You will not find a human being that's walked this earth that was more pure than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But that weakness in that amal had an effect on the heart of the Prophet that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got confused in the recitation. My young friends, you know these gunas that we do by day and by night. And astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. How many gunas? How many gunas? How many gunas that we commit day by day and by night? I mean, only last a week or two, I was reading reports about, you know, they had how many, you know, uh, organs they were selling. They taken organs out of people, poor people, and they were selling them in Pakistan. They got caught, but then about 300 organs they had. Look at the zulm. Look at the zina. Look at the abuse. I mean, how many times you and I commit these uh, commit the uh, uh, sin of zina by looking at ghair mahram women every single day on our phones about 50 times a day? Every single one of us is committing guna, guna upon guna upon guna. If a amal which is not doing which is not being done proper was having an effect on the Prophet Wasallam, what do you think this is having an effect on the nizam of this universe? Obedience, dhikr sustains this universe. Dhikr sustains this universe. This, the nizam runs as it should be running. When there's no dhikr, what will happen? When there's not a single person on this earth that utters la ilaha illallah, that utters the name of Allah, there's the absence of dhikr. This entire universe, nizam, darham, barham, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ انْتَثَرَتْ The stars will fall 
the sun will become bay nur the heavens will split the seas will go on fire this is in the absence of the dhikr of allah and when there is only disobedience on planet earth this is what it does to the universe so all what is happening at this moment in time is because of our disobedience and if we don't turn to allah then nothing is going to change nothing is going to change nothing is going to change don't be faced by these nuclear powers i'm not for saying i'm not saying for one second that as a, as a muslim as muslims we don't make preparations i'm not saying that for one second my young friends but for me all these are secondary what's going around on on social media at this moment in time okay we should be doing this we should be doing this we should be doing this i do not disagree with any of it as long as it's within the perimeters of the sharia and within the limits of the sharia i have no problem with anything but for me these are all secondary and they will not have the desired effect if we don't do the real thing look at our khair al qurun when i say don't be faced by all these nuclear powers and everything that goes with it it's meaningless just like you have these powers today that rule the dunya or assume or, 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 or believe they themselves that they rule the dunya whether it's america whether it's russia and china more or less these are the powers when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came you had two powers that were running the dunya and they were mighty powers they were just like the powers that you have today it was the romans and persians but what did the believers have at that time you tell me what did they have what do you have today you tell me you want to go by zahiri asbab and you and i believe that zahiri asbab will make a difference my young friends in terms of resources i don't think you'll disagree i'm just going to make this one point guys and i'm going to conclude if you allow me to do that jazakallah khair ahsan al jaza in terms of dunyawi resources what do we have today how many countries how many muslim countries do we have 50 plus i don't know the exact number but we have 50 plus muslim countries what we got in terms of wealth i don't think we can calculate it look how much we're spending just on football how much money has been spent on football how much did qatar spend on the world cup just making preparations for the world cup what they're going to do with the stadiums how many billions they spent what they spent on the world cup you know half of these african countries don't have that as their yearly expenditure how much are we spending now on people like ronaldo and what else you know racing now boxing we want in so how much are we spend the amount of wealth and resources that we've got in all these muslim countries why do you think people want to do raj and hukumat and rule over muslim countries it's only for the resources they say pakistan is a nuclear power and when you read about pakistan you know mashallah they'll say okay, it's one of the best military the army is one of the best you know when they have these competitions it's always the pakistanis that are winning and you know one of the best armies so we've got you know we've got armies we've got resources we've got oil we've got gas in terms of number how many have we got just under 2 billion in a few years islam will be the biggest religion on planet earth so you know you're looking at zahir because this insan is influenced by zahir So when we look at this power okay hold on let's not mess around with this one it's got nukes because zahir they look they look very very powerful I'm not saying for one second as muslim countries we shouldn't be making preparations what I'm saying is we're forgetting the asal with all these resources how much is it of you and I got today how much is it you can pretend and i can pretend there is no one more disgraced and humiliated more than us 
If there's anyone that's go is it at this moment in time, it's the people of Palestine because they bow, bow down to no one besides Allah. They would rather die with Izzat than to live with Zillat. And we would rather die with Zillat than live with Izzat. We can pretend that we've got Izzat, we've got no Izzat. When I say no Izzat, how many times, how many times our Nabi has been disgraced? How many times? How many times? Who did anything about it? Who could do anything about it? There's, there's under 2 billion. No one. No one. Somebody will do it again tomorrow. Somebody will burn another Quran tomorrow. Somebody will insult the Prophet ﷺ again tomorrow. What is it have you and I got? What good are your resources? What good is your wealth? What good is the military and the planes and everything that you have? What good is anything? What good is anything? If you can't even protect the honor of your Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, people have got a lot of hope that this country will do this, this country will do this. This is this Ajis Fakir Miskeen's Rai, only Allah knows the truth. They will do nothing. It's lip service. Everyone's got their own agenda. And it's just lip service. If something was going to be done, it's been happening for 75 years. Nothing has been done. And I can't see anything happening in the future. The only way forward is if you connect with Allah. You connect with Allah. Look at the believers in the early era. What did they have? What do we have in terms of resources? You know the first battle of Badr, the 313. Yeah. And this was the ma'riqa, the decider between haqq and batil. Truth and falsehood. Those that participate in this battle when it comes to Islam and ranks from amongst the Sahaba, they the Ali, the Badriyin. Allah said with regards to them in the Quran, they can do what they like, Allah has forgiven them. What did we have as an ummah in terms of resources when them 313 went out with the Prophet ﷺ to fight a thousand strong who had the resources? Forget anything other than just look at the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. What was the dua the Prophet ﷺ was making on that day? Listen to his dua. Allahumma innum jiyaun fashbi'hum. Allahumma innum hufatun fahmilhum. This was the dua my Nabi was making. Prophet ﷺ was crying to his Lord, crying to his Lord. And he was saying, Oh my master, oh my master, these companions of mine are hungry, feed them. Tell me, my young friend, how can you fight an enemy with your stomach empty? How can you fight? You fasted in month of Ramadan. What becomes of you and I when we know in the evening we're going to receive a meal but during the day we've been fasted. We fast. We become frustrated. We lose our cool, anger. We find it difficult. You know the swords that they used to carry, you know, today with full stomachs, two of us would probably wouldn't, wouldn't be able to carry the sword of Umar. And they would have to fight in that state where the Prophet Wasallam is saying okay, they're hungry. Look, in, look in Khandaq. Not only were they hungry, hunger was at such a level, such a level that the Sahaba had thin stones tied to their stomachs to ease the pain of hunger. And they were surrounded by 12,000 men. All the Arab tribes of Arabia had united to annihilate the believers from the face of the earth. And that time was so tense, so cold, so difficult. So hungry that Allah describes that situation. The uh, that the believers were shaken a mighty shaken. The Prophet was about two stones tied to his stomach. But my young friends, you know when the Sahaba were stunned in salah, stunned in salah. 
I'm talking about the hunger so you get an idea. When they would stand in Salah, how many of them, how many of them would collapse in Salah because their legs would not be able to carry them because of starvation. Look at Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira says, I would faint between the member of the Prophet وسلم, and Hazrat Aisha's room. So he would faint in Riyazul Jannah. I would faint between the member of the Prophet and Hazrat Aisha's room. I would collapse. Passers by would pass by and they would place their feet on my neck thinking Abu Huraira has become insane. And then Abu Huraira says, it wasn't that the Abu Huraira had become insane or become a madman. It was hunger. Days would go by in which I wouldn't receive a morsel to eat as a result of which my legs would not be able to carry me and I would fall unconscious. When they went to fight the Romans and this was one of the powers that was ruling the world, how did they go? 600 kilometers is Tabuk and that between 10 of them, there's one Savari, one Camel. So if he's walking, he's walking nine miles and he's riding one mile, if that's how they sorted their turns out. 50 degrees centigrade. And what they're what they sustaining themselves on? A handful of dates. And when they run out, what were they sustaining themselves on? The, the stone of the day. Just, you know, like bubblegum kids just chew it all day because, you know, so they were chewing just the, the date seed, sucking that the whole day. And they're going to fight the Romans that ruled half of the world. Look at it like this, you know, some, what do you call it? Some people from the Amazon basin today in that state where they bechari, hardly got any clothes to cover and they're now going to fight America. There's no comparison. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the dua he was making, innahum jia'un fashbi'hum. He was making dua, innum uratun faksum. Oh Allah, they send me naked, clothe them. Forget, you know, armor for protection. Some of them got what, one sheet of cloth, balke in namaz. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had instructed the women. They used to read namaz, the men read makes up. Then the chula makes up and the women makes up after. So the Prophet Sallallahu in namaz had instructed the sahabiyat, Okay, you know when you go into sajda, don't raise your head straight away. Just wait for a second. Let the men raise their heads first. Why did the Prophet Sallallahu tell the Sahabi to do this? Because some of the Sahaba had only one sheet to cover their body. So there was fear that if they raised their heads sooner, straight away, their eyes may fall upon the satr of some Sahabi in front of them. So that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them, okay, just wait a second, let the men raise their heads first, and then you raise your heads. This was the state of the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In <laughs> Barefooted. Barefooted, and they're going to fight. And they're carrying sticks. Half of them even got swords. They're carrying spades. This was the situation of 313. You tell me, my young friend. You tell me what happened. Which was the army that was victorious? The army of Allah. This just was the start. They came in Badr with 3,000. Again, I haven't got time to explain, guys, unfortunately. But it is what it is. And I'm just going to wrap it up. I feel bad within myself. But it is what it is. They came in Uhud, 3,000. Muslims were 1,000 at the beginning. The hypocrites, they ran off, left with 700. For every one, there's around five non-believers. They were defeated. In Khandaq, they all came. They were defeated. Every battle thereafter, the army of Allah, and I'm purposely using these words, the army of Allah that would prostrate by night fast by day and elevate the kalima of Allah by day nothing stood in front of them in battles there were 5,000, 10,000 the Persians came in 100,000 200,000 when they would see them and there were times where you'll find in a hadith they would walk over water as one walks over soft sun. And when the Persian would see them, they would say, Diwan Ahmad, Diwan Ahmad. These are not human beings, these are jinnat. And they would run from the battlefield. 
Rome and Persia melted before them like snow melts under the hot sun. Nothing, nothing, nothing can stand before Allah's name. Nothing can stand before Allah. You can have as many nukes as you want. The army of Allah cannot be defeated. You know when Jalut and Talut وَقَاتَلَ دَاوُدُ جَالُوتَ I keep on getting confused with Jalut, Talut. So you had Jalut and you had Talut's enemy. Uh, sorry, you had Talut the king and Jalut the enemy. When they set off, there was about 70, 80,000 of them. They disobeyed Allah. They became tus. Only 313 went forward. As Dawud Ali Salatu Wasalam went forward to fight Jalut. He has no weapons. Talut is giving him weapons. And this was as Jalut's response, as Dawud respond. If I have Allah with me, then I need no weapons. And if I don't have Allah with me, I can take all the weapons. It'll make no difference. And all he took was a catapult. And that's it. In the name of Allah, he went. He shot him with a catapult between his eyes. And he was finished. And his army was defeated. This is the law of Allah. You turn to Allah, you can have no asbab. No asbab. And Allah will take care of your affairs. Just like Allah did in how many battles? How many battles? They came with sticks. Yeah. And they would see, they would raise their hand and they would see the head fall off the enemy right before their eyes. Because Allah had said, Min al-malaikati masawwimeen. Min al-malaikati murdifeen. Allah takes care of his affairs. And if today, if today, from today, the more we turn to Allah, the problem is, and this is what we don't realize is, you and I are the cause of what is happening in the dunya. But we're quick to blame the leaders. We're quick to blame everyone. But nobody sees his own weakness. Alanki, my young friends, you and I are the problem. Until we don't rectify ourselves. If every single one of us just in this gathering turns to Allah, my young friends, the more obedience there is, Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلُ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْ وَلَفَتَحْنَ عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ If the people believe and fear Allah, what does Allah say? I will open the heavens, it will rain of barakat. What does Allah say in the Quran? وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبُمْ يَصَّحْفِرُونَ Allah will never punish them whilst the Prophet is alive and Allah will never punish them whilst they turn to Allah make istighfar. Allah says, أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ Who will inherit the land? Who will it? Salihun. If you look at throughout history, who's made a difference? It was always the pious king, Salahuddin, Nuruddin, Harun Rashid, Sayyidina Umar Farooq, Uthman, Ali, Umar. It was always the pious kings and leaders that made the difference. My young friends, if we turn to Allah, if we turn to Allah, you will see change come about. Not just in the blessing land of Sham and Palestine. My young friends, you will see change come about in every corner of the globe. Why do you think the birds make dua and the fish make dua? Because when you do good, it affects them. Affects the entire universe. Dhikr benefits the entire universe. This is why they make dua. So Allah give me the tawfiq. Yeah. That's the least that we can do. Every make tawbah and every single day in every namaz that you make dua for them. Balki throughout the day, that is what occupies your mind. And you know at the same when you make that dua to Allah, you know whatever's happening is happening because of me. Allah, it's because of my wrongdoings. I've transgressed. I've wronged. Oh, my master, I promise you that I will never wrong you after this day. Oh, my master, have, have mercy upon the entire ummah of my Habib and especially the people of Gaza, especially the people of Palestine. Come as come. Bas iskarata lagalu. Whether you do anything else or not, come as come. Come as come. Come as come. Just keep on repeating these words. These words. Inshallah, inshallah, this will attract Allah's mercy. Allah give me tawfiq, Allah give you tawfiq. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.